Good day, everyone, and welcome to Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History, Part 17. Uh, I've entitled this talk, The One and the Many. Now, since we've been talking about 5th century Athens and Greece in general for a while, I think it's time to turn toward one of the most important figures, if not the most important figure throughout the world's entire intellectual history, and that's Plato. It was Alfred North Whitehead who boldly stated that all of Western philosophy was but a footnote to Plato, and I'm inclined to agree uh, regardless of whether that's for good or for ill. Now, uh, Today's talk is more or less an amalgamation of points that I've drawn from other great teachers of Plato's dialogues, like Michael Segru and Louis Marcos, uh, amongst others. I'm simply repackaging this information and giving my own commentary. I highly recommend getting your hands on Professor Segru's lecture series Plato, Socrates, and the Dialogues, if you want to explore this stuff in more detail on your own. Okay, so Plato's dates are 428-ish to 348-ish BC. Um, he was an Athenian philosopher and mathematician, and after the model set by Pythagoras, he was the founder of an academy in Athens, which is generally acknowledged as the first institution of higher learning in the Western world, uh, but I disagree with this on account of Pythagoras's school at Crotona. Now, something that's amazing about Plato, and which I gave good reasons for in the last lecture, is that Unlike all of his contemporary philosophers, Plato's entire collection of works is believed to have survived for over 2,400 years. This is rare. Uh, this never happens. We, we hardly have anybody's entire corpus, um, but we think we have all of Plato's works. Now, um, Plato's teacher was Socrates. Uh, and his most famous student was Aristotle. Aristotle would eventually be the teacher of Alexander the Great, who would take Platonic and Aristotelian ideas and really promulgate them throughout the world on the back of a Greek education system. Now, I want to start by mentioning that Plato in his early life is not the same as Plato in his late life. This is the kind of thing that we can discern when we've got a full body of literature from a single author. We talked a lot about Plato in our last lecture, and we saw how much of the early Platonic writings dealt with the problem of the sophists. Plato's philosophy was initially a reactionary philosophy. But it didn't end there, of course. We can see uh, a grand drama unfolding in the writings of Plato throughout the years, moving from a man concerned with pure reason and rationality, with the purely Apollonian, uh, and then moving toward the more mystical side of things, toward the Dionysian aspect which we can see at work in the dialogues like the Parmenides, or even later, the Timaeus. Well, in order to understand where this whole mystical side of things began in Greek philosophy, we need to start messing around with our timescales again, and look back to the so-called pre-Socratic philosophers, because we really can't fully understand where concepts like the realm of forms, or anything like that, until we look at the people who preceded Plato. We need to look at how they perceived the external world, the world of senses, which, uh, if we go far back enough, 
is really the only world originally known to man. And I must say, uh, some of these guys deduced really amazing things from pure sense perception. Well, in regards to this, we've got another dichotomy at work. And arguably, this dichotomy is more of the same dichotomy we've already been talking about. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to relate it to other such concepts of duality like Boaz and Yakin in the Freemasonic tradition, or the Apollonian or Dionysian uh, in the writings of Nietzsche, or whatever. So, this dichotomy that was very much at work during the time of the pre-Socratics, as it is now, was between what we might call the naturalistic thinkers and what we might call the mentalistic thinkers. The natural thinkers were among such greats as Thales of Miletus, uh, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Democritus, and these guys. Um, we often call these folks the Ionian physicists on account of being mostly from Ionia, uh, the western coast of modern Turkey, and being concerned with matters of fusis, which means nature in Greek. So these are the naturalists. They were looking at the universe as a purely mechanical process, as atoms whirling around in a void for no real reason. What was most important to these guys is that the world is in a constant state of change or flux. Water precipitates, accumulates, evaporates, condenses, and so forth. Fires ignite, grow, shrink, and die. From this perspective, there's no pure being. There is only becoming. Heraclitus was a huge proponent of this school. Uh, Pantare, everything flows. You can never stand in the same river twice. For these guys, talking about things like pure being was pointless. There was no practical application. Well, it turns out Plato didn't really like this Heraclitus or really any of these Ionian physicists. But of course, um, they were all dead by this point, so they weren't really around to care, except Democritus, of course. Now, this is because this worldview they all shared presumes that all truth is merely relative to our senses. And, well, you've just got to listen to last week's lecture to see what was all the rage in 5th century Athens and how this notion of relativism posed a serious problem to society. Now, as we discussed, the ideological school of Plato would stand in support of, and essentially become its St. Paul, so to speak, and that's what we're calling mentalism, or idealism more loosely, with its focus on the logical rather than the empirical. What can be determined by pure reason versus what can be measured with our tools and experienced with our senses. The dominant figure in this movement before Plato's time, uh, of course, was Pythagoras, who we've discussed in detail. But then, last but not least, we've got Parmenides. And this guy is, I would say, the most extreme of the idealist school. And on the level of pure reason, I entirely agree with him. Uh, he's the foundation of the Platonic project its home base, so to speak, from which it will set out on campaign to assault the keeps of sophists and naturalists. Where Heraclitus says all is change, Parmenides says all is one, all is static. Where Heraclitus doesn't believe in a realm of forms, 
Parmenides doesn't even believe in space and time. Uh, Parmenides thought the world wasn't just some river of atoms in a flux of becoming, because he thought of it all instead as just one big being with a capital B. At the same time, you don't need forms of chairs and plates and chariots, because they all participate in one giant, extremely complex and multifaceted form of being, uh, which is suspended in space like some hyperdimensional object. What Parmenides does, essentially, is apply a sort of skeptical, deductive reasoning which tosses all of sense perception out the window, and this is something Plato would take very seriously as a starting position for his work. He starts from the idea that it doesn't matter what you feel or sense, that's all an illusion. It's all shadows dancing on the walls of a cave. What is actually real, then, is the miracle of one thing, to borrow a line from the Emerald Tablet. This line of reasoning, almost doubtless, came from the East, particularly from India, and made its way to Greece through travelers like Pythagoras. Now, it's from this tension between these two schools of thought, the Eastern idealistic monism and the Western empirical perspectivism, that all Western philosophy would rise. Reincarnation, the immortality of the soul, uh, mystical ascent to higher levels of understanding, the emphasis on mind as a first principle, all of this kind of stuff just fits perfectly into the Parmenidean, Pythagorean, and Platonic viewpoints, but really doesn't have much place in the world of physics. Or at least not yet. Here we've got a highly articulated form of rational mysticism coming from these guys, which would prove to be a worthy foe against empiricism even up to today. And I see this really uneasy tension rearing its ugly head all the time when it comes to things like doing clinical trials for psychedelic drugs, uh, as outlined in books like Rick Strassman's The Spirit Molecule, or the studies on psilocybin done by Roland Griffiths at John Hopkins University. Science has a very hard time wrestling with the mystical experience, and vice versa, predominantly because they have different goals in mind. The one view wants to know what things are, and the other wants to see what things do. I mean, it's a rather interesting fact that if you take all the mystics and saints from all the various faiths of the world and do a comparative analysis of what they're saying, they almost unanimously agree that the world is an illusion um, and that there's some sort of greater underlying reality to this one, whether we want to call it God or Brahma or the realm of forms or whatever. But what can be done on a practical level with this information? Well, not much, which is why modern science has little care for such matters. It wants the infinite plurality. There's nothing it can do with this notion of transcendent oneness, so we really can't blame them for feeling the way they do. I like the example Michael Segru uses as a physical analog to Parmenides' The One, um, it's like a logical black hole which sucks up all the light around it and allows none of it to escape. Well, where the infinite plurality of relativism turns us all into solipsists and fundamentally destroys our ability to communicate with one another to any degree of efficiency, well, the inescapable oneness of absolutism has a strong logical attractiveness it sucks everyone and everything into it, and thus erases all of our distinctions. What we're left with, then, is being is. And of course, 
we've only had to break this idea down into two words because our language forces us to have a subject and an object. So in reality, we're just left with being. But then we also wouldn't want to distinguish between the articulation and the articulator. So we'd just be left with Or maybe just the sacred syllable used in India. Aum. Because that's all that's left to say besides nothing as we asymptotically approach the one. The infinite plurality destroys language, but the infinite unity also destroys language. So again, what are we left with? We're left with the idea that both extremes, between idealism and materialism, mentalism and naturalism, absolutism and relativism, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, all extremes are detestable. So then we might say that the project begun by Socrates and Plato, essentially, was to move more toward the center between such poles. Let's imagine these polarities as a scale from 1 to 10. If Parmenides is a 0 and Heraclitus is a 10 on this scale, then we could say that Plato would have started at 0 in his early years, and by his middle period had started slowly moving to the right. Unfortunately for Plato, it would take the West a lot more than one or two lifetimes to come up with a theoretical state of equilibrium between the two. If forced to choose between Heraclitus and Parmenides, Plato would definitely have chosen Parmenides. But in any case, I'd put Plato somewhere at a 1 or a 2 on this imaginary scale, whereas I'd put someone like, um, I don't know, uh, William James on a 5, maybe, on account of his school of philosophy called pragmatism. In any case, Nobody would come to such ideas until the 20th century. So until then, Socratic dialogue would be the first technology invented as an isthmus of communication between two oceans of silence, as Michael Segrew puts it. And this is really what makes Plato so crucial to the history of philosophy. He was the very first man to start scratching a tunnel out from the logical prison of Parmenides's The One toward a more sensible, more practical view. What's important to note is that that tunnel did not start from the other side. What Socrates is trying to do as he roams the streets of Athens, questioning everybody he passes by, is he's trying to give an account of language that doesn't dissolve into this infinite plurality of individual rhetoric where we're all talking to ourselves, but it also doesn't collapse down into non-speech altogether, into an inarticulate unity, into the alm. Plato wanted his cake and to eat it too. Okay. So all this ties right into what I'm about to discuss, and that's Plato's relationship to the so-called poets, which I just touched on briefly. Plato was, ironically, as we'll see, the first of history's literary critics, and likewise, uh, one of history's greatest literary geniuses. In his great utopian work, his uh, ideal society called the Republic, Plato postulated through the mouthpiece of Socrates that it would be in the best interest of a perfect society to do away with poets. Now, why is this? As some of you may know, the Republic is one of Plato's longest dialogues, and the central question to the work is this. What is justice. He asks this because, like I mentioned, 
His project is to restore the integrity of words. Now, the way Plato tackles this problem is under the assumption that the universe is fractal or self-similar across scales, and that truth is truth regardless of things like scale, he envisions an ideally just society. As above, so below, what makes society just is the fact that its individual constituents are just. Now, an ideal society needs ideal rulers, of course, and a large portion of the dialogue is dedicated to an ideal education system which could churn out ideal rulers. Um, this is what he calls the guardians. After discussing what it is that these guardians should and should not read in Book 10, Plato tells us very boldly that something the guardians should not read is poetry. And not only that, but Plato also thought that the poets should just be given the boot entirely. This ideal society of Plato's wouldn't have any poets. Now why is that? There's a deep metaphysical or philosophical reason behind this choice. This isn't just some flight of Plato's fancy. It's systematically consistent with his conception of the universe. Now, what lays at the root of the issue for Plato is the problem of mimesis. Mimesis, as some of you may already know, is the Greek word for imitation or copy. To Plato, poetry was essentially an unreliable source for truth. This is truth with a capital T. Because on the one hand, there is reality, and then on the other hand, there is a cheap imitation of reality, which is what the poets and artists give us. Remember, for Plato, the material world, the world of becoming, is but a shadow. It's a mimesis. It's an imperfect copy of the supracelestial invisible world of pure being, the realm of forms. Now for most people, even most religious people, except for maybe a couple fringe Gnostic sects, whatever it means to be a fringe Gnostic, uh, this world here the material world is real, whereas up there in heaven or whatever it is you want to call it, there lays a shadow world. Now, Socrates was deeply entrenched in a traditional pagan society. To a pagan, this world is real. There's nothing outside of it, and it would be an extremely radical notion to propose anything different. But that's exactly what Socrates did, and it's no surprise he was put to death for his beliefs. If you remember back to Homer's Odyssey, when Odysseus meets Achilles in the afterworld, Achilles tells Odysseus something along the lines of, I'd rather be the slave of a landless peasant than a king over all the shades of Hades. Well, Plato is turning everything around on its head. What he does is say that this world down here, this material flesh, this world of substance, this is the illusion. The real reality is up there in the realm of forms, in the heaven of ideas, this place that can only be accessed by the intellect, by consciousness. And it's a place where everything is perfect, eternal, ethereal and unchanging. Everything up there is in a state of being, not becoming. This, of course, stands in opposition to our world, where everything is transient, flowing, rotting away, and corruptible. Okay, so we've got Plato believing that everything down here on the material plane is made up of imperfect copies which exist up in the realm of forms. Essence precedes existence, 
he would have said. And this is the absolute opposite of what the 20th century existentialist philosophers would argue, that existence precedes essence. In layman's terms, uh, Plato thinks reality is laid out for us like an architect's blueprints before we live it. Time is merely the moving image of eternity. Opposite to this view is the idea that we enter a void or a vacuum and we are fully free to create our own reality. We, we build our essence. The most famous and commonly used example to explain this concept of a celestial blueprint is the chair. Obviously, there are millions of different kinds of chairs in manifestation, uh, but what is it that binds all of these together? What makes us see a chair and say, uh, yes, that is a chair, uh, as opposed to a puddle of water? or your grandmother, or a skyscraper. Well, it's because every single one of these lowly, corruptible, and imperfect chairs are but copies of the original idea or form of the chair. All chairs of this world are chairs insofar as they participate in chairness, and that it's chairness that essence that we tap into when we encounter a heap of materials fashioned into a sitting device. Now, to Plato, this line of thinking works not only for trees and chairs and puddles and grandmothers, but also with abstract things like virtues, things like justice, piety, love, and so forth. So. With the example of love, we can say that there are many different kinds of love down here in our material world, but it's changing, it's fickle, it comes and goes, it takes on different forms, and so forth. In the dialogue called the Symposium, we find out that all earthly love is but an imperfect mimesis or shadow of the true form of love with a capital L. So if we remember Diotima's ladder, she says we must move from the love of one body to the love of all bodies, and then from the love of all bodies to the love of all souls, and then from the love of all souls in the forms of laws and institutions, we move to the love of love itself, to the form of love in which all other displays of love participate. All right, so where does art or poetry factor into all of this? Just a quick thing I want to mention. In our modern parlance, we tend to think of poetry as one art form, as distinct from written prose. Um, and then quote unquote art as a broad umbrella term which covers music, visual arts, sculpture, etc. Well, in the Greek mind, poetry just meant something that was made or fashioned. Um, which is also what art means, etymologically speaking, if we go back to the Latin. So Plato's criticisms of poetry should really be taken to apply to any kind of art, except perhaps music. Um, this doesn't just refer to metrical written works like Sappho or Homer. So to Plato, Art is not just an imperfect imitation of a thing, it's the imitation of an imitation. It's the shadow of a shadow. It's twice removed from real reality. If I paint or sculpt 
or write a poem about a chair. I'm certainly not making a copy of that great chair in the sky with a capital C. No, I'm, I'm imitating that transient physical chair in front of me. My poem, then, is a copy of a copy. It's even further removed from the truth than the realm of illusion which we all perceive with our senses. If you know anything about the allegory of the cave, which is in the Republic, uh, Plato argues that the people who are ensnared and bedazzled by the world of imitation are like prisoners chained at the bottom of a hole, forced to stare at shadows dancing on a wall. Now, I want to give a bit of context for this concept. We need to remember that Homer played a central role in the education of youths throughout the Greek world. But to Plato, this was all a load of nonsense. Look at all these young men reading about Achilles. He's clogging up rivers with the bodies of his enemies. They're getting all these fanciful ideas about the glory of warfare, listening to this blind bard romanticizing toil and bloodshed. Well, aren't they in for a rude awakening once they're initiated into the harsh realities of war, which is really what something like Homer is supposed to prepare you for? I feel like Plato's point is still a relevant one today. Um, I have lots of friends who really love reading science fiction and fantasy novels, and when they throw a recommendation my way, I usually tell them I get enough fiction from just reading history which is already imperfect enough as it is. Fiction, which is really just the modern equivalent to this word poetry we're using, since they both just etymologically mean something made up, uh, can actually be quite dangerous if you start saturating your world with it. If you start subconsciously conflating the real world with notions you pulled out of a book or movie. Now, the irony in all of this, of course, is that Plato is using myth to convey all of these philosophical concepts to us, so we'll get into that later. Now, let me conjure up an example for you on this point, which is relevant to the modern world. Lots of us watch crazy action movies and play violent video games. Now, I'd never be the type of guy to say watching or playing these things will turn you into a psychopathic murderer overnight, because certainly there's no lack of these PC fools running their mouths. However, if you don't think consuming this sort of media has any sort of gradual, deleterious effect on your consciousness, you're horribly mistaken. There's a good reason the US military pushes games like Call of Duty and movies like American Sniper on the youth. Now you may play or watch these sorts of things, uh, sitting in your larval state, your eyes glazed over, your fingers stained orange with Cheetos dust, passively taking in all these symbols. You may be having lots of fun, but ultimately you're being imprinted. You're being conditioned. Your malleable subconscious is being reorganized to fit in line with this artificially simulated world, this imperfect copy of a copy, this simulation of a simulation. Your brain is malleable. It's constantly changing in accordance with its inputs and outputs. So then what happens? Well, now you've got a bunch of kids running around thinking they know and understand the realities of warfare. They think war is fun. They buy into all the dehumanizing propaganda from their movies or their games. Then a small but significant chunk of these youths wind up joining these death cults we call the military, and then they end up seeing how war really is. Next thing you know, we've got a huge swath of our population with blood on their hands, with PTSD, with limbs blown off from landmines, roadside bombs, or whatever. 
This, this is just one of the many ways in which poetry, or art in the loose sense of the word, is a force of corruption in youth. Another example we could use, perhaps humorous and outdated, is romance novels. Women used to eat these up before soap operas and sitcoms were invented, you know? Uh, the kind that you see in line waiting at the grocery store with different permutations of Fabio on the cover. These kinds of works create a whole slew of false expectations, hopes, and desires in people. You read a hundred of these novels, then all of a sudden you aren't satisfied with any of your relationships in the real world because they don't fall in line with the epistemologically naive constructs from your overactive imagination. This is just another way fiction can be harmful. The poetry doesn't need to involve blood and guts and glory. There's all sorts of ways that we can be led astray by the fiction we consume. It's kind of like sharing a drink or a smoke in a large group of people. Uh, the more people you take in germs from, the more likely you are to get sick. Just like that, the more neurotic fantasies you allow to enter your head, the more likely you'll be to catch the disease of neurosis. So, this is the metaphysical reason why Plato kicks out the poets. Because poetry corrupts the soul. Now, there are a million more things I could say about the Platonic project, but I'll just have to come back to Plato as we go through the rest of history, because his ghost never rests. Uh, before I end today's lecture, I want to take a minute to talk about the notion of a dual soul or psyche in Plato. This notion, which would come to full maturity in the conception by Frederick Nietzsche's Apollonian and Dionysian, or Freud's id, ego, and superego. We find this polarity in the soul broken down in all sorts of esoteric traditions, uh, especially when we're dealing with Jewish mysticism. Um, I'm thinking chiefly of the two pillars in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the pillar of severity on the left and the pillar of mercy on the right, uh, or the two pillars in Freemasonry, Yaquin and Boaz, which by now are just great symbols but were derived from the two bronze pillars on the porch of Solomon's first temple. Now remember, in Freemasonry, Solomon's temple represents the soul, it's not a physical building, and uh, these two pillars represent two perpetually opposed aspects within the self. The feminine and the masculine, the emotional and the rational, the wild and the civilized, the raw and the cooked, the organic and the artisanal, the dark and the light, and so forth, on and on. Now, Plato had this dual conception. Well, it was really tripartite. Uh, in many iterations of this concept, there's always a synthesis between the two poles. But for our purpose, let's say it's a dual conception of the soul. He represents this idea in his dialogue called the Phaedrus, where he talks about a chariot led by two winged horses. The charioteer represents pure mind itself. Unconditioned consciousness, we might say. Then we've got the one-winged horse representing the rational, structured, moral, and logical side what would eventually come to be called the pillar of mercy, or the right hand of God, the masculine aspect. Uh, just remember, masculine is not male, there's a difference. This Nietzsche would come to call the Apollonian. On the other side, we've got the horse who represents the soul's irrational, unbridled, ecstatic and emotional side. This is the pillar of severity, the left hand of God, and it's the feminine aspect, uh, what Nietzsche would call the Dionysian. Um, and this all plays into the concept of why Dionysus was fundamentally an androgynous god and was chiefly worshipped by women until around the 6th century, until around the 6th century BC. So Plato explains to us how the charioteer directs the entire chariot, the soul, 
or what I referred to before as unconditioned consciousness. And what this charioteer is trying to do is stop the horses from going off in all sorts of different ways, allowing him to proceed toward enlightenment. Enlightenment for Plato is about reining in the wild horse and letting the rational horse take the lead. Now, I couldn't disagree more, and here's my problem with this. Plato is pedestaling the Apollonian. He's got an a priori assumption that the tempered, the ordered, the civilized, the structured, uh, the balanced, the harmonized, that these things are somehow intrinsically better than the wild, the organic, the natural, the ecstatic, etc. He's assuming from the very get-go that Fusus is somehow inferior to Nomos. And this all ties very neatly into what we were talking about last week. If you take Plato to assume his starting position is correct, then yeah, you're going to see things his way. But if you oppose Plato in his starting assumptions, then you'll see it's all hogwash. Again, my suggestion is to marry these two things, this synthesis and this antithesis, and then you make a thesis. You don't prize one over the other. You need to strike a balance between these two poles. And that's actually way harder than picking an extreme and putting your blinders up. Enlightenment is about acquiring unity consciousness through the middle path not squelching your emotions and taking up formal logic courses at your local college. Now, this presupposition explains a little further Plato's dislike of poetry. To Plato, poetry was purely a Dionysian act. It was like an ecstatic revelation from God. Um, it possesses you, and it drives you mad like the oracles at Delphi. Love and drugs are the other two forms of madness, according to Plato. Um, the Apollonian arts of, of architecture, of lawmaking, medicine, and music, uh, string music, of course, not godless drumming, um, these were thought to be therapeutic and constructive to an ideal society, whereas poetry was destructive. Poetry is this orgasmic outburst of emotions, of irrational words and sounds and ideas all strung together in this wild concatenation which has the danger of dragging everyone down into madness along with you. Remember, Plato hates speeches. He wants to find the truth in dialectic, and there's really no dialectic involved in the process of ecstatically firing off all manner of sublime nonsense. Now, here I should mention that Plato didn't hate all poetry. He made concessions in his perfect society for two types of people which he felt were edifying and useful. These were hymns to the gods, and songs in praise of state heroes. I would wish to add to this list that Plato probably felt that in his ideal society, there'd sure be a lot of people reading Plato, the greatest poet of them all. Plato tends to shy away from the fact that he's a poet, even though it's through telling myths like the myth of the chariot and the winged horses, or the myth of Ur, or of Diotima, or of Atlantis. It's through these stories that his message sticks, not through some hard and fast examples in arithmetic, or algebra, or geometry. Inasmuch as the sophist's philosophical position eliminates the truth, and thus eliminates the need for teachers, and thus leads to a sort of philosophical suicide, Plato, too, also puts himself into this hole of self-negation by saying that all poetry is degenerative and pointless, 
all the while using poetry to explain this concept. Remember, both extremes of the debate here between absolutism and relativism or idealism and realism are detestable. They both lead to hypocrisy and thus have to be reconciled to one another. We will come back to this concept over and over again throughout our history of the occult. But for now, you've been listening to the Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History, and I'm your host, Dan Attrell. Thank you for listening.